I'm now found of every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of the loudest praise. Teach me some. was listening to the song this morning it was marriage supper of the lamb and it kind of goes along with this will be a good segue into the the introduction tonight but you ever hear something in a song and and later maybe even years later you're reading well that's in the bible well it's it's probably a pretty good indicator if they're writing gospel music they ought to write about things that's in the bible right but that song talks about we are living in a dry and thirsty land do you know where that comes from? Anybody know where that comes from? Hmm? No, not where the dry... Well, I mean, there probably are a lot of dry bones out there, but that's David. I believe it's Psalm 63, but I know it's in the Psalms. David's in the wilderness, and he, he's been running, and he's on the run for his life, and he says, I'm in a dry and thirsty land. But he goes on in the next couple of verses where he says, I will sing praise to you anyway. And that's kind of what the song begins with. We are living in a dry and thirsty land today. But we sing praise to Him anyway because we know what's coming. The marriage supper of the Lamb. That's where the church will be during the events we're talking about here. The, 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 the wedding feast that we'll be attending. But I started this by talking about overlooked prophecies. You'll see the, the title here. Overlooked prophecies. And, and by overlooked I don't mean that we just skim over them and and go away. But there's a lot of things in Zechariah that we learn. We, we know a lot of it. We've heard a lot of it preached and taught through, through years of, of prophecy study, especially here at this church. But oftentimes we don't know where it, some of those things are. There's a lot of details in prophecy. Where are those things? And we begin to read through Zechariah and we see things. Just talking about Jesus returning to the Mount of Olives. We know that in Acts it says this same Jesus will return in like manner he left from the Mount of Olives, so one can assume that he'll return to the Mount of Olives, but we have proof in the Old Testament. That's where he's coming back to, and that's found in Zechariah. Just like in, you know, you read uh, that we will walk by faith, not by sight. When that's quoted in the New Testament, they're quoting an Old Testament book of Habakkuk. I will walk by faith, not by sight. So all Scripture is good for us. Doesn't the Bible tell us that? All Scripture is good for, for the betterment of our lives, for the correction. All things are influenced by the Word. We'll talk about that tonight as well. It's, a, it's rather short tonight, just the, the last few verses here, a couple of different chunks of passages, but we will probably end a little early, but that's okay. I'm going to wind this down, and then I'm thinking... I had no plans. My, my, I had plans to, to start looking at the feasts again. We've got a lot of new members coming in, new people that haven't heard that teaching necessarily. That's where I wanted to go, but I started reading Zephaniah. And how many of y'all have read the book of Zephaniah in the last forever? So I think we're going to take a look at that. Three short, three short chapters in the book of Zephaniah, but the themes are still there, pointing to redemption and salvation through Christ, and judgment for those who choose not to, who choose another path. But we're looking at overlooked prophecies. So we, we're not going to go to the screen just yet. But we have looked at a lot of different things from chapter 9. We skipped 10 and 11, and we started with again in 12 and 13. Chapter 9, 10, and 11 are prophecies that are already fulfilled. 12, 13, and 14 look to the future. I started in chapter 9 to give you a glimpse of how they could be or how they should have looked at things in the days that Jesus was on the earth. They had those things fulfilled. They had those things fulfilled. And I can only imagine, especially when Jesus was on the earth and he was walking with those, uh, those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says, the Bible says in Luke 24, that he 
spoke to them about all things from Moses to the prophets. He went through a Bible study with them and told them everything about him. I guarantee you, he mentioned those things that we find in the book of Zephaniah and Zechariah. They, they, were, they were, I guess you'd call witnesses to his teaching that. So he was claiming those things. But what we have here in 10, 11, and 12 is future. It's future to us. We look back at the past, we see fulfilled prophecies, and we know that the Word of God is true. And we look at that in anticipation of the future. We know that Jerusalem has to be in existence for Jesus to come back. We look back, that, you know, Israel came about in 1948, and Jerusalem was back under Jewish control for the most part in 1967. We know those things had to happen. So we can look back and we can say the Lord is working. But when we, the first point I've got here is something that, you know, Bill helped me to see. Remember I said that we don't, sometimes we tend to rush prophecy. We tend to think that things are already fulfilled. And I can remember in my mind saying that Jerusalem would never be taken again. That is not biblical. Zechariah 12 and 13 tell us of this overrunning of the city and the pillaging and the, the ravaging that will go on during that. Jerusalem will be overrun again. And the city will be taken before, before Jesus comes back. And you know, we kind of look at the way the, the, the state of Israel is today and we say never again. They have that slogan. Um, I won't even call it, I don't like saying slogan. They have that mindset that came about from the Holocaust, never again. But there is coming a day when they will be overrun and persecuted and hunted again. They will be overrun. Jerusalem will. All nations, this is part of the review, all nations will be against Jerusalem. We get a little bit of the glimpse, we get a glimpse of that in Revelation when it's talking about the battle of Armageddon. But it goes into deep detail in the book of Zechariah. Uh, again, talks about the pillaging and all those things that will go on. But all nations... I believe that that includes all the armies that are in existence and probably delegates or officials from other nations that may not have armies. But all nations will be in opposition. They will come against Jerusalem. Two-thirds of the Jews will perish. Very few references to that particular stat in the Bible, but we have it here in Zechariah. Two-thirds will perish. After the announcement that is made by the Antichrist and his false prophet, when, when the proclamation comes forth from the temple, the abomination of desolation, there will be a worldwide persecution of the Jews and two-thirds will not make it. Two-thirds will perish over that next three and a half year period. One-third will survive. Revelation chapter 12 talk, talks about them escaping uh, on the wings of a great eagle it talks. Uh, and it talks about different places they will escape to the desert. The Lord will fight for Jerusalem. We have in Revelation 19 a picture of that, of the Lord coming back on that white horse and all of the armies of heaven with him. Remember, it gives a description of him covered in blood. I don't know necessarily if that's the enemy's blood or if that blood is symbolic of the blood of Christ that he died for us. I don't know if there's a way necessarily to know that or not, but it talks about him coming back. We have greater detail of that in here. Remember, it talks about the word of the Lord as a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. The mighty power of God on display in the, in the battle of Armageddon will, will render all enemies defenseless. They won't be able to stand in the light of that glory. Then we get to something that we don't always see in the Old Testament prophecies. Uh, it's not you know, a common theme through a lot of these. But we see something that we don't ever really see in this world. We see true repentance on an individual level, but we see true repentance here on a national level, a corporate level where all that are there, Paul says all Israel will be saved, that one-third will look upon the one they pierced, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And they will each one escape to themselves. It says this, the family of this and their wives apart 
That's what it's talking about. They each individually look upon him and they each individually make the choice as we have to do. Yeah, Ronnie? The Jewish people now that, that are believing God and practice God, uh, they believe in the Old Testament, right? They do, yes. Do they believe in that scripture? Oh, yes. But they know, they understand. The Jews that are saved today, a Jew that is saved today is probably... The ones that are not saved? Yeah. They're, they're Jewish. If they, if they are of an orthodox belief, I'm not sure their, their exact thoughts on this. I'm sure they're looking for their Messiah to come the first time. They're still looking for, for their Messiah the first time. They don't believe He's come yet. But those that are saved understand this and they understand that it's not a corporate decision yet. All Israel, the mind of an entire nation will be changed. Have we ever seen that before in the history of the world? An entire nation. You might have the leaders of an entire nation be, have a biblical mindset or, or, or concept of God and a concept of good moral biblical uh, outlooks on life, but we've never seen every person alive within a race, within, well, I won't say a race, but within a, within a, a, a national ethnicity convert like they will. Did that happen? I'm not sure if it was the whole, but did Nineveh convert when John preached We don't have record that every, well, I'd have to read it again to see if every human, that would be every, that's, that's a city. That would be a city, one of those city-states. I don't know if you consider it the entire empire of Assyria, but Nineveh did convert. But I don't know if we have verification that everybody in Nineveh converted. But it's a good, it's a good thing to look into. Every Jew that is left and looks upon Christ escapes to themselves... They contemplate what they did. They understand sin and they understand the redemption that came the first time and they choose Him. They choose Him. They still have to. It's not some miraculous salvation that God just automatically changes their hearts. They still have to look upon the, the Lord Jesus Christ and make a decision. The Bible tells us in Zechariah that they do that. They repent on a national level. What a sight to behold. What a revival. We pray for revival. That's the ultimate one, an entire nation. Can you imagine if the entire nation of the United States turned to him? The things that would happen. Can you imagine if the entire United States just followed the Ten Commandments? Just the first ten. What a, what a world we would have. But what we're going to see tonight is the effect when Jesus comes. When Jesus is on the scene, when things are God-ordained in this world, change happens. Change happens, and we're going to see that in the last few verses of this. Well, let's go ahead and get started here. I'm going to go back to, we'll start in chapter, in verse 11 when we get there, guys, actually verse 12. But I'm going to read just a couple verses before it. Uh, let's start in verse 9, Zechariah 14, 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Oh my, king over all the earth. And in that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. This concept of one. That's one reason that got me reading the book of Zephaniah is I got uh, guided to that talking about one pure language. Zephaniah 3 9 talks about the world speaking that one pure language. It's, a, it's part of the blessings to the Gentile nations out there. Verse 10 And the land shall be turned as a plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem, and it shall be lifted up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate unto the place of the first gate, unto the corner gate, and from the tower of Hananiel unto the king's wine presses. This is the big one right here. Verse 11 And men shall dwell in it and there shall be no more utter destruction. But Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. This is what happens when Jesus touches down. And He begins to build and move the earth. He begins building what will be His, his, his city, his, the prince's portion there. He will begin to administer what the kingdom will be like. He sets up His administration. Much like a presidential election, 
They're elected in November. They don't start till January. They got a lot to do before that actually sets up, before their reign sets up. But Jesus has got some things to take care of. And that's when we see the judgment of the nations and, and the building of his temple and things like that. He'll be working on those things. But Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited from that point on, from that point on, for that thousand year period, nobody comes against that place. And you're going to see the change that happens with the people and the city. The previous chapters talked about that even they are so convinced that Christ is the Messiah, and they have turned to Him so much that they will not even tolerate their own children speaking false lies. That's the attitude. The attitude has totally changed. They believe Him. But He's going to bring about more change. Verse 12. We go back here. That's the reason I stopped at verse 11. Verse 12 takes us back to the enemies. The enemies here. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Now, there's a lot of uh, you know, debate out there as to what this plague is. There's, it sounds like this. It could be this. I just know it sounds devastating. Take a, take a listen to this. Their flesh, now this is to the people that fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their, the holes, the sockets, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. Sounds pretty grim, doesn't it? Pretty gruesome for those that come against Jerusalem. Remember when he said, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone? You come against Jerusalem, you will be dashed into pieces. You will not make it out of that. People have debated whether this is a nuclear weapon. Could be, could be an actual plague. Could be a plague where they're, they're tormented inside their own flesh. I don't know, but the plague goes further. It, it affects even more. And it shall come to pass, verse 13, that a great uh, tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one uh, uh, on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. It's like friendly fire, but it's... You have casualties of friendly fire when there's confusion about who someone is. If you've ever watched those World War II miniseries that HBO put out years ago, you see examples of that where, where they attack someone of their own. They're, they're in such a state of mind that, that war would cause anyway. But this comes from the Lord, this, this delusion, this confusion, and they begin to attack themselves. And Judah shall also fight at Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together, gold and silver and apparel, in great abundance. This is where we have to realize that it's not all of a sudden. It's not all at once. They're going to be battling. The plague will come. But over time, Jerusalem will become the economic superpower of the world. They will be rich. They will, what we would say, they will be loaded. People talk about the amount of money that runs through Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge and Sevier County and, and just how much they can do in their county with education and, and highways and roads and things. Jerusalem's going to dwarf that by millions. All the treasures of the world, all of the capitalism in the world will come through Jerusalem. It will be the economic center of the world. That is something that has not happened. It's literal, though. It's literal. That's one thing that I want you to see in all these. These prophecies are so specific that they cannot be interpreted anything but literal. It's not allegory. It's not spiritual richness. This is talking about material wealth. But it will be a blessing from the Lord to Jerusalem. Verse 15, And so the plague of the horse and the mule and the camel and of all the beasts shall be in these tents as this plague. The enemies of Jerusalem will face it. Their animals will face this plague, whatever it is, whatever the Lord deems is necessary. So this is signaling utter defeat for the enemies of Jerusalem. And it's not just pleasant. You ever heard of that concept of annihilation? Some people preach that there is a, 
the destination of the human soul is annihilation, where you just cease to exist, where there is no heaven or hell. It is just ceasing to exist. That is, a, I'll be honest with you, that's a comforting thing to believe in. Because what else is there? There's no eternal torment. It's just like you didn't like, honestly, like our pets. Just ceasing to exist. I can see why in people's own minds they make that the object of their religion. Because it's, it's peaceful, it's comforting, it's not unpleasant. But boy, do they not know the promises of the Lord when it comes to heaven. A reunion. Did we sing Glad Reunion Day sometime? In, did we sing that this morning? I don't know. That was on my mind. We, we, we sang something this morning about reunions and, and, and seeing the people that we love. That's, that's more comforting to me than ceasing to exist. An eternity of, of, of great things is, is more comforting to me than ceasing to exist. But in the same way... I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on from that before I, before I get too deep into something else. So we've got utter defeat. It's not going to be pleasant. It's not just going to end. They're going, they're, they're going to suffer. They're going to face the wrath of God. The wrath of God will be poured out. Revelation 16, excuse me, 19 talks about when he comes on the scene, just how bad it is. It seems sudden and it seems quick. Zechariah fleshes it out for us. And we know that it's not so pleasant and it's not just, boom, they're gone. To oppose the Lord is to invite His wrath and they will suffer it. They will suffer it. Now is where we get a division in the book here. We get a division and this is where we're going to close it out. This is where we see the change and the impact of the Lord being present. I always say that there are two proofs that you can see that God exists. One of those is the fact that Israel exists today. Because there's no other, there's no other civilization that was alive then that is alive today. It is just the Jewish race. But the other is you and me. We can be proof that God exists and that the Lord exists and that salvation exists because we can show the change in our lives. I know some of you may have not have done the things that I did, but you still had the mindset of a sinner. It was still all about you. That's the way it is. We don't teach babies to be selfish. Anybody teach your kid to be selfish? Anybody have to teach them how to lie? No, that's in us. Things change. When Jesus comes on the scene and when God is the ruling factor... Things change, and I'm not, and we're going to see it on a level here. It goes beyond the change inside of us. What we can see today is Israel and changed lives. That is how you know that God exists. That's how you know this thing exists, because the Holy Spirit is the only thing that can, that can combat selfishness and pride. That's the only thing that can help us overcome those things. And we see people overcoming them. You ever, anybody ever heard a motivational speaker talk? It's a preacher that doesn't use the Holy Spirit as the reason for the change. And that, you know why they're still employed? Because it doesn't work. It doesn't change you. It doesn't bring about that change. It's inspirational and it's motivational at the time. But then we get back in our own self-serving ways. But when you have the Holy Spirit present, the change can begin to take place. This is, you're going to see a change here in the little, I won't say littlest, the smallest things in life. So let's take a look here in verse 17. Actually, verse 16. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations who came against Jerusalem shall even go up to Jerusalem year after year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, to keep. The Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is that end of the year celebration, the end of the harvest celebration where everyone comes together in Jerusalem and they celebrate God's provision and His presence in the wandering in the, in the desert. All those years ago, 
And they celebrate it still today. It's called the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Sukkot, Tents, Tabernacles. And this will be, the, really the Millennial Kingdom is the ultimate celebration of that. It's the ultimate fulfillment of that when God is there again in our presence. But these people will come up year after year after year after year after year. Nobody goes to, up until, what, a couple of years ago, when delegates came in, they didn't go to Jerusalem. They went to Tel Aviv. They went to Tel Aviv. That's where all the embassies are, most of them. Tel Aviv. We started a, a very good trend, moving our embassy to Jerusalem. But people don't want to go there. Too, too confrontational. Looks too bad. But every nation will come up year after year to go to Jerusalem, and they will worship the king. Verse 17, and it shall come, or it shall be, that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. There will be some defiance to the Lord over time in this millennial kingdom, in this thousand years. People will test the boundaries because they are still living in human bodies. We will have glorified bodies. I remember being afraid of coming back because I thought, I don't want to sin again and go through that whole process again. That was my thought as a young Christian. I don't want those things to happen. But these people will still be in their mortal bodies. They will test the limits just as kids test parents' limits and students test teachers' limits and people test limits. Jesus says, if you don't come up, no rain for a year. You know somebody's going to try it. Now take a look at this. Take a look at the next verse. And if the family of Egypt not go up or go not up and come not, they will have no rain. There shall be plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that comes not to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. What we've got here, we do have defiance of the heart throughout this thousand year period, uh, rebellion in the heart. It's just we don't have that open rebellion that's not swiftly dealt with and put away. You still have the, the rebellion of the heart. But why I mention Egypt specifically? Egypt doesn't depend on rain. What do they depend on? The Nile River. It's interesting that he picks a nation here to mention that they don't depend on rain in that particular area. But they do depend on the rains that happen in the south that fuel the Nile River. Down in those mountains way further south in Africa where those, those floodwaters feed the Nile as it goes up to Egypt, they will still experience drought and famine and plague. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. There will not be that open rebellion. There will not be debate. There will not be a council that gathers together to discuss this uh, statute that the Lord sets forth. No one will change his mind. There's not a committee to come together to present the pros and cons of not going up or it's too far or too expensive. As a nation, you will go up to Jerusalem year after year. In that day, verse 20, verse 20, in that day there shall be upon the bells of the horses holiness unto the Lord. That is all in caps there. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Holiness to the Lord is what was written. I think it's called, is it called a mitre? Is that what it's called? It's like a crown that was written above the high priest. You remember Spock that would do this, live long and prosper? The reason that he did this, he made this symbol, was because it makes the letter Sheen, for which we get one of God's names, Jehovah Shama. This is his name. And what the priests would do is on the Day of Atonement, I believe it's the Day of Atonement, when they would make that, that, that main offering, is they would have their hands here, and, and the, the smoke from the altar would pass through it, but it was never lifted higher. His hands were never lifted higher than the words written here on his head. Nothing was higher than holiness to the Lord. But now it's going to be on the bells of the horses. You know why horses will be holy? There'll be no war. Horses will have no 
reason to be used as instruments of war. Gone are those days. Pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Verse 21, Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. It was nothing, it was nothing you know, spectacular to consider the instruments in the worship of the temple holy and consecrated to the Lord. Kind of like that piano. Tom talks about that a lot. That piano is dedicated to the service of the Lord. We're not going to have rock music played on it or anything else. There are pianos out there and keyboards out there that are dedicated to that purpose. This one is dedicated to playing the hymns of the church and songs that Larry sings. But they all bring glory to the Lord. The change that happens upon the earth now is that every item in Judah and Jerusalem, every common item is now dedicated to the service of the Lord. There will still be jobs there will still be an economy. There will still be money trading hands. There will still be all the things that we have today without the openness of sin. But everything, everywhere, and everybody has in mind that Jesus is on the throne. We better do these things right. We will have these things as they are meant to be. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and... And in that day there shall be no more the Canaanite. What's the Canaanite represent? Sin, pagan religion, in the house of the Lord of hosts. And that's where Zechariah leaves us. He leaves us with a change that happens. We see a change. When Jesus comes on the scene in this millennial reign, things change. So I'm going to end with, with just a few things here we see that when God is involved, things changed. All the way back in Zechariah 9, there was nothing that could stop the campaign of Alexander the Great. He conquered, when we talked about him uh, invading that island nation of Tyre, he was building a bridge in the ocean out to the island. Nothing could stop the devastation that this man was going to bring. Nothing could stop his empire. He goes down the coastline. He goes down into Egypt, conquers it, lays waste. As he's coming back up that natural land bridge that connects Africa and Asia, he stops by a little town named Jerusalem with intent to overrun it and take it. But in that moment, God had other things that was in mind. And through whatever method it was, he changed the heart of that tyrant. And Jerusalem was spared. When God is involved, things changed. And he went on. It wasn't time yet for the overrunning of Jerusalem. That happened later under Vespasian in A.D. 70. But when Jesus came on the scene there in the Gospels, he changed a lot, didn't he? Can you imagine how those 12 men... Well, 11 that were saved at the time. Can you imagine what they faced? They were either crazy or right. Why else would 12 men, and, all, and those in the, the 120 in the upper room, all, all those that were gathered, why else would you take on an empire like the Roman Empire? And then you're taking on the people that used to be your friends and family. The primary persecution originated from the Jews on the Christians. And then the Romans came in. Why would you do that if it wasn't real? Why would you claim a man rose from the dead, something so outrageous, something so out there, why would you claim that if it wasn't true? Why would you take on an empire? For, for that, there are a lot of other things you could come up with that would have been believable. But for a man to be dead three days and rise from the grave? Why would you do that if it wasn't real? Fishermen and tax collectors became world changers because God was in it. You ever heard the Gaither song, Little is Much? Is it when God or if God is in it? I think it's little as much when God is in it. Little is much. Twelve changed the world. 
Those 12 men plus Paul are probably the reason you're saved. They're still changing the world. That's the next one. Hardened criminals. Men so zealous for the, the Mosaic law that they killed and tormented Christians across the globe and then he became the best Christian that ever lived. When God becomes involved, things change. You've got a godless nation. It sounds awful to say this in the nation of Israel today. But it's true. They are not spirit-filled. They are not spirit-filled. They rely on being close enough at the Temple Mount to get so close to a certain location. We're past that. We're past locations. We now worship in spirit and in truth. But He's going to take a godless nation where today it is illegal to proselytize. It is illegal to go into that nation, Israel, and witness to another person. Illegal. Jews do not seek converts. That's not their, that's not their purpose. And it is illegal. But He will change it into an entirely converted nation that looks upon Him and becomes dedicated to Him. So much that everything... The change that's going to happen when He sets foot on the Mount of Olives... Take a look at the landscape. Bring that up, Caden. He's going to bring life. I don't know if this will work or not. He's going to bring life to the Dead Sea. He's going to change the landscape to fit His purpose and His needs. When He comes on the scene, change happens. And that's what we need to remember as we read Zechariah and we, and we leave this particular study. Is, is there a change that happened in you? Is that change still ongoing? It should be. We learn things about ourselves and we change them. David was a man after God's own heart. When he sinned, he repented of that sin and changed. And he went always changing. I don't know if we have record of him repeating the same sin over and over and over. Once he repented of it, he was done. He was a man after God's own heart. When Jesus comes on the scene, things change. And I have it written here, when God is a ruling factor in our decision making and our lifestyle, things change. Is there something about you that you can change today for the better? We're going to talk next Sunday morning about the title is, because I know Tom will be asking me in a day or two, the title is How Serious Are You? How Serious Are, are We? I should say. How Serious Are We is the title. How Serious Are We About Our Walk and Our Lives? When we read through the Bible, does the Bible, even though it's talking about future events of which we'll, we'll be there, we'll see it, but we're not part of that particular nation that changes. Does it inspire change in us? Does God speak to us and say, things change? You've still got to change. We, we're, we're getting better and better and better and better and better. If we are people, if we are a people and a group of believers that believe we are here for a purpose because God's left us here, how many times do we say that? We say when people are sick, you're still here, God's still got a plan. We, we know it and we believe it. How many, how many of us go for that? and get out there and get moving, things change. And what we need to do is bring Jesus into the lives of other people and see things change. You see a lot of change happening in this book. Even pots and cups become holy because they're consecrated solely for the Lord. And that's because He's there. And that's the way we should be because He is here. Anybody got anything before we leave tonight? Knowledge of why there's a millennium because of the change of Jesus. But is there any spiritual reason that it lasts a thousand years? Is there any reason for that? I'm always wondering about that. Why it lasts particularly a thousand years? I don't know if we're given that particular answer. Some people say, you know, the, the Lord, or what is it? One day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and that, that is the 7,000th year of, of existence. Could be that. But I think it gives us time to realize that length of time without outside demonic influence 
I think him ruling and reigning on the throne and multiple generations coming through that, it still is evidence to us of the heart's need for Jesus Christ, regardless of outside influences, because we are born sinners. And you even see at the end, even after that long, after a thousand years of perfection, living in a world where things are great, the heart will still rebel. Some nations might. I think a nation that is as powerful as the United States now will, will probably be incorporated into that into that political alliance that will happen over there, probably with with uh, with the Antichrist or whatever. But it, we, I don't know that. We could be completely crippled and completely pointless because of implosion. I can't imagine the devastation that would happen in a nation with as many Christians as we have at the rapture of the church. I don't know. Uh, I mean, it, it, you're going to have a lot of nations over on the other side of the world that are mildly affected as far as population. But here you're going to have a lot of people vanish and, and a lot of devastation, collateral damage really, that... That'll, that'll go on. Think about babies inside the womb. We believe life begins conception. at conception. Those babies, gone. I don't know what that does to, to a human body. I mean, doctors, uh, pilots, all, the, all those Christians that are, that are working and operating at that time. There's going to be a lot of, lot of damage over here. Did somebody else have, somebody have here? I thought somebody else was going to say something. So I don't know if we know that for sure, what that could be. If we have any relevance, I think we'll be pulled into that with our mindset that we have today anyway in this country. I think we could be pulled into that alliance of, of, with the Antichrist. I don't, I don't know for sure. I don't know if anybody knows for sure. But I know that the devastation will be unreal in this country. talks about the nations that's going to be involved. I think there's 17 countries. Not, the war of Gog and Magog? Where you... yeah, it's going to be involved. And more likely, the United States will be involved. It will be forgotten. And we may, and, and there's no guarantee that there will even be United States at that point. I mean, we could implode before then and be off the global scale of significance of, of any kind. Uh, you know, a thousand years, Ronnie was talking about a thousand years, and I'll close with this. Think of all the history that has happened in the history of our country, and we're what, 260? Close to 260? Are we close to 260? That's a lot of math to do at one time. But imagine a thousand years. A thousand years. Many countries of the world can can grasp that concept of the history of a nation because they're that old. We're not. We, we don't think that. We don't think in terms of thousands of years. We think in terms of decades and, in our lives. And, and we even build for decades. That's why we have so much uh, infrastructure problems. We build for 50 years instead of hundreds. I think you said it best when you said, when you said the rapture. We can't imagine America without churches and Christians, but this nation is going to be completely devastated at the rapture. We, we just can't, we can't, picture, we can't picture our nation that wicked because of here we are in a church right now, and if every one of these folks left, think of the homes that would be involved. Mm -hmm. So we, we, can't, we can't imagine what's going to be happening here after the rapture. I don't want to see it, but I won't see it. <laughs> no, that's the thing. Just make sure you don't see it. That's it. But the, the main point I wanted to leave with you tonight is things change when Jesus is involved. When, when the Lord is involved, things change. Our lives continue to change. Our attitudes continue to change. And that's what we need to make sure that we're taking that to people that need to see it. Lives changed is the greatest 
evidence of Christ's existence and, and what He did for us. It, it really is. And, and to see that and to be proof of that is, is, is huge in this world. Look at Paul. Can you imagine the convincing that it took for some of those people to believe that he was truly changed? But it was his lifestyle. It was his lifestyle and, and, and those things. Anyway, anybody got anything before we go? All right, so I think I'm, next week I'm going to go, I'm going to start in Zephaniah. And, and, and what Zephaniah will do eventually, when we get later into it, he'll flesh out some more of these things in prophecy. And he pulls from it. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of interesting stuff in that, in that short little book there too. Anybody got anything before we go? All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day you've given us. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the assurance that as bad as it will ever seem and as, as bad as it has ever been described, you will change things for the better in the end. Lord, I pray that you use, use this message to show people that, that when you come on the scene, lives change. When your people are on the scene, lives are changed. Lord, help us to do that. Help us to be the change and inspire the change in others. But Lord, help us to deliver a clear message of your son and your son crucified and resurrected from the dead as that is the whole key to it all is belief and confession of that to come to that knowledge that we're at the end of ourselves and that we have to depend on you. Nothing that we do will ever get us to heaven. Lord, help us to communicate that clearly that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, thank you for the ministries that, that go on here and all that goes on uh, outside of this church with, from, from the people that are out there delivering messages and booklets and tracts. Lord, Lord, help it just to be fruitful, whether we know it or whether we don't. We thank you for all that we do, all that you have done for us, and give us opportunity. Pray for opportunity, we do. I thank you and praise you in all that you are, in Jesus' name. Amen.